Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It's a great snowy Sunday here in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and uh, this is 153greatfish.com. Um, I think it's getting close to Christmas, but I don't have a Christmas message today. And uh, But I do have an important message that uh, all of us need, especially yours truly. Let's begin with prayer, shall we? Jesus, we love you, Lord. We praise you, mighty God. We ask you, Lord, to just enlighten our minds and our souls. God, I pray you'd help us to be what you want us to be, to reflect your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, here we go, right to the PowerPoint. Today's topic is how we get robbed. How we get robbed. And of course, uh, this is for people that have been in the church and have fallen away. And it's also a preventative cure for those who are going to get tried and uh, go through a trial. Those of us that will go through a trial, because all of us will. So how do we get robbed? And here's my outline. I want to talk about the thief's mentality and his tactics. I want to talk about Judas Iscariot, the premier thief of the New Testament. Passion story thieves, who were they? How to steal a reputation. And the real thief robs people of truth. And we don't want to become the devil's co-worker. That's what we're going to talk about today. So what is the mentality of a thief? Uh, these are some of the things that I wrote down, having studied it, that uh, many thieves have an attractive charisma, charm, funny, nice, engaging, infectious, disarming. But here's a quality, uninhibited by shame. Now, these can be great qualities for people that are in sales <laughs> or people that you like to hang out with. But there's other qualities that a thief has other than these, but uh, thieves can be charmers. So here's the moral code of a thief. Never pay, discount truth, discount the truth, and repetitively steal. I think that's probably the, the biggest one right here is the repetitive thieves. I think many of us have probably stolen something in our lives, whether it was a candy bar in a store or something, but uh, we don't repetitively do that. But a thief doesn't have the same moral code. They never pay. So here's what a thief does. They groom a vulnerable victim with flattery. We call this social engineering. They're defiant of authority without guilt. And they often are master debate champions. They can really spin an argument. They have a lack of empathy. They have no compassion for their victims. This is a narcissist mindset. They lie easily, but they'll lose track of them. They're enamored with their own self-importance. Cowardice. They look for vulnerable victims to impose their will and to control them. They're jealous and they dis and, and jealousy and disdain. They bring out slander. Now that's a key burglar tool, slander. They do not value integrity or honor. What do I mean by that? Fair pay for fair work is optional to these people. They easily betray a friend privately. They'll badmouth them and they'll kill reputations. And the greatest fear of a thief are these two things, authority and truth. Those are the two things that a thief fears most. So let's talk about Judas Iscariot. The word Iscariot means the village of Kerioth. A lot of people don't realize that. They think that Iscariot is his last name. It's not. It's Judas of Kerioth. That's a village in southern Israel. He's the thief that's portrayed in the Bible. Now notice, Judas was not necessarily a murderer, although his thievery became murder. John 12 says this, Then said one of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which eventually betrayed Jesus, why was not this ointment sold for 300 denarii, then given to the poor? This Judas said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and he had the treasurer's bag, and he observed how much money was in the bag. So we're beginning to get a profile of Judas, who is really a profile of the devil. And uh, Judas, it's not that he cared about the poor. He wanted that money. Psalm 41.9, in prophecy, God says, Yes, my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat from my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And of course, that phrase, lifted up his heel, means that he has betrayed me. 
in John 13, Jesus quotes this. I'm going to sew these pa passages together from John 13 here. I know whom I have chosen, Jesus said, but that the scriptures may be fulfilled. He that eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. He's quoting Psalm 41.9. So when Jesus had said this, he was troubled in his spirit. He testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Jesus answered, He it is whom I shall give the sop, that's a morsel of bread, after I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, the leper. And after the sop, Satan entered into Judas. Then said Jesus unto him, what you are thinking, do quickly. Now there's a lot here, okay? Why was Satan able to enter into Judas? To betray a friend is to hang yourself, is to hang ourselves. All murders must be covered with either silence or a lie. Judas Iscariot started out as a thief and his thievery ended up in murder of Jesus Christ. Jesus knew that Judas had an open doorway for the devil. The truth was not in him. So here's the passion story in Thieves. Barabbas, son of Abbas, was a notorious and convicted thief imprisoned in Jerusalem around the Passover in AD 33. The high priest religious council of the day planted manipulating crowd exhorters. Saddam Hussein did this all the time to ensure that Jesus would not be released and freed by the Romans. When people are in groupthink, mob fashion, the people follow and shout, at least in, in that day, give us Barabbas. I recently read about some protesters at uh, the uh, uh, museum that was dedicated here down in Jackson, Mississippi. And the point is somebody paid them to be there, okay? And they are no different than those people that shouted Give us Barabbas. The Romans released Barabbas and decided to execute two thieves with Jesus. Now this was their attempt to transfer guilt to Jesus by association. Why two thieves? Why Barabbas? The Bible is telling us that thievery was considered the worst of the worst crimes. And they wanted to make Jesus into a liar. So they crucified him with two thieves because all thieves are liars. Now no liar shall inherit the kingdom of God, the Bible says. No drunkard shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Listen, all of us have told lies. We need to repent and restore what we have stolen because what thieves lives, a thief's lies are actually stealing. Matthew 27, 38 says this. There were two thieves crucified with Jesus, one on the right hand and one on the left. One Jewish thief repented. Now that's a necessary Old Testament provision for salvation along with circumcision and sacrifices. Many people think that the time of Jesus was the New Testament. That's wrong thinking. The New Testament began on the day of Pentecost, okay? Everything was Old Testament up to that point. So the thief on the cross that repented, he's Old Testament. Many people use that excuse about the thief to say, see, you don't need to be baptized. The thief on the cross never got baptized. Well, baptism was not part of the Old Testament. But the other thief rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is proof that a thief can repent. And when a thief repents, they tell the truth. And he said, We are receiving the due rewards of our deeds. Now, that was the truth. You see, a thief has to be confronted with either authority and truth. And that's why Jesus told this thief that repented, you'll be with me in paradise today. All right, that's a different lesson. But what I wanted to show you was that the thief on the cross was not a New Testament salvation. He was Old Testament. He was Old Testament. So how do you steal a reputation? Well, the Jews paid two false lying witnesses and they were required to execute Jesus because capital punishment under Judaism could not be executed without the mouth of two witnesses. A thief must lie in order to steal a reputation. People must be manipulated to believe a lie. They shouted, give us Barabbas. Guilt by association is a key burglar tool to the lie of slander. 
Why didn't Jesus defend himself, you might ask? Many people want to ask the question, why didn't Jesus just come out and say, I am the Son of God? Why didn't Jesus come out and say, be baptized in my name only? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Here it comes. Jesus was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And there's a reason why Jesus did not open his mouth. And like a lamb that has led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Jesus could not testify. Why? Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, so you say. So the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate again asked him, have you no answer? See how many things they testify against you? But Jesus made no further answer. And Pilate marveled at that. Jesus was silent. Here's why. Jesus said in John 5:31, If I witness concerning myself, my witness is not true. The devil, this was the devil's only trap for Jesus, to get him to self-declare, to self-witness without a second witness. Jesus could not witness about himself. None of us can. That's... Uh, very similar to bragging. Jesus could not say, hey, I didn't do any of these things. <laughs> these guys are lying. He didn't defend himself because of this verse right here. A real thief robs people of truth, and we know who that real thief is. Ten times, Paul says in his letters to the seven churches, I would not have you ignorant. Now, people that don't read their Bibles are ignorant. They cannot receive truth. Now, one guy told me yesterday, he said, I don't believe anything unless it's three times in the Bible. Well, I thought to myself, well, that's his own personal doctrine, but the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. So we can believe two witnesses. The Bible says the word and the spirit are the witnesses. And then I was tempted to ask him, how many times have you seen it in scripture where, where somebody says, be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost? One time when Jesus ascended, but seven days later, later, and thereafter, all the apostles baptized using the name of Jesus only. Four times. I ought to ask that guy, have you been baptized in the name of Jesus, or do you prefer to remain ignorant? John 8 says this, Why do you not know my speech, Jesus said, because you cannot hear my word. You are of the devil as father. You're the, you are of the devil as father, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He did not live in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and a father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. What is Jesus saying? A liar who does not live in the truth cannot hear. Cannot hear. The word and the spirit agree. Matthew 7 says this, Jesus said, go in through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there are who go in through it, because narrow is the gate and straight is the way which leads to life. There are few who find it. Listen, if you feel comfortable being part of the majority, then you should be a Muslim, a Buddhist or a Catholic. That's where the majority is. OK, but if you believe in the word of God and you believe that it's truth, then that's a narrow gate and it's straight and few, few find it. And that's the tragedy is that many people are deceived. They don't know their Bibles. They don't listen to the Holy Ghost to confirm the word and they cannot find the straight and narrow gate. The devil seeks who he can devour with his devices. Paul said, we're not ignorant of his devices. His basic devices are this. He murders the truth with lies. He uses philosophy and not scripture. And he uses the new age man-centric humanism to make people feel good. Feeling good and knowing truth are two different things. <laughs> and sometimes truth hurts. Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth and sell it not. It's wisdom, it's understanding. The devil slanders truth speakers and he enters those who are open to betraying their friends. Only a liar betrays their friends like Judas did. Second John 14, this is what the Apostle John said to his converts. He says, I rejoice greatly that I found your children walking in truth as we have received command from the Father. Listen, it's not enough to know the truth, but we have to walk in it. We have to defend it. We have to buy it and sell it not. And the devil comes against truth. The two things he's most afraid of 
is the authority of the name of Jesus and truth. So the devil has co-workers that don't walk in the truth. And who are they? Let's take a look. How can two walk together unless they're in agreement? Do you agree with your friend's plan of salvation? If you do, then support him. But if you don't, why are you supporting him? Ephesians 5.11 And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. What are the unfruitful works of darkness? False doctrine, false apostles, liars, people that do not love the truth, but rather reprove them. <laughs> That's what the Bible is telling us to do. Don't fellowship with them, rebuke them, give them the truth. 2 Corinthians 6 says this, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's people that don't believe the truth. For what fellowship does righteousness have with lawlessness? And what partnership does light have with darkness? And what agreement does Christ have with Belial? Or what part does a believer have with an unbeliever? And I would say, what partnership does a believer have with an unbeliever? The unwitting helper of the devil. Okay, you don't want to become the thief's partner. Don't be unwitting. Don't be an unwitting helper of the devil. Here's what it says in 2 John 1. Everyone transgressing and abiding not in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who lives in the doctrine of Christ, he has both father and son. That's Jesus Christ, father and son. If somebody only sees him as son, they don't have the father. If somebody only sees him as father, they don't have the son. Father and son, that's who Jesus Christ is. That's the doctrine of Christ. If anyone comes to you, and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor speak a greeting to him. For he who speaks a greeting to him is a partaker of his evil deeds. Listen, if you want to help the false church, that's your business. But I'm going to give you this warning. Don't be a partaker of their evil deeds. For he who speaks a greeting to him is a partaker of his evil deeds. Just emphasizing that. Can you say praise the Lord? Well, that's where we're going to stop today. And uh, uh, I'm sure I got under the cross some people today. And, and, uh, but I felt that you need to know what the Bible says. We need to know it, all of us. We need to walk with those that are in the light. We need to be a partaker of the true gospel, not a false gospel. The thief will rob us. If you used to be in the body of Christ and you've fallen away, the thief has robbed you. He's given you a bunch of junk. Get rid of it. Read your Bible. Allow the Spirit to confirm the Word. Walk in the doctrine of Christ. God bless you today. We'll see you next time here again on another edition of 153greatfish.website.